thank, thank you for uh, coming to talk to us. Uh, tell us who you are and how you are associated with the B-58. I'm uh, Daryl Schmidt and uh, I flew the B-58 as a pilot aircraft commander from uh, about uh, 1966 till we flew him out to the graveyard in Tucson in 70, 69. What did you think of it? I loved it. It was a great airplane. I had uh, flown the, the B-47 and the B-52H and uh, from I got into the sort of the second half of the B-58 program which was uh, relatively better because it was safer by that time. In the early stages, especially in the, some of the test phases, it was uh, uh, causing some problems. But by the time I got into the program, they had most of the problems solved. You could enjoy the airplane. Yeah, actually I enjoyed it. It was, it was really nice having a, a stick. I was kind of surprised because I had come from the B-52H, which is the, the latest model of the B-52. We got them up in Minot, North Dakota, brand new, right off the assembly line. Still had the new car smell. And they had the flight directors and uh, fancy autopilots, air refueling autopilot mode, all those sort of things. And I was sort of surprised that the B-58, although it had some great avionics, didn't have a, any uh, flight director or uh, none of the uh, equipment that I was kind of used to in the B-52. But I still enjoyed it. What, uh, what were some of the, the key points that you really enjoyed about the B-58? Well, one is that uh, there's only one pilot. Then there's no room for anybody else. In B-52s, uh, I was an instructor and evaluator, and I always had somebody with me. And the co-pilot, of course, you had to share every other landing with your co-pilot, and we didn't fly that often. In a B-58, you're the only pilot and there's no room for even anybody to get in and look at you. So you, you only did what you'll admit to when you got back down. How fast did you fly the airplane? It was as fast as it would go, uh, and legally, that uh, we were limited to, to standard was Mach 2 uh, or uh, 600 indicated knots, uh, whichever was more limiting, and you had a 115 degrees Celsius ram air temperature limit, and uh, but uh, periodically, temporarily, you could go up to Mach 2.2 and up to actually 660 and knots, 660 knots, uh, depending on the temperature and uh, the altitude. Did anybody ever fudge that? And I'm sure they did. I understand they've had some come down with the uh, stars and stripes burned off from the heat. But not you? Not me. I was just very, very cautious. <laughs> Uh, tell us what what do you think it would mean to Fort Worth to have uh, B-58 back here? Well, this is its birthplace. I think every person or thing should return to their birthplace when possible. They built it here. It was uh, a big activity for the commerce of Fort Worth and for the people of Fort Worth. And they, some of them probably still don't know that the B-58 was actually built here. And it's um, I think it's important for them to know their history. Uh, what what do you think um, would be a good way for for uh, um, the aviation nuts in town to explain to people what is this airplane? You know, how do we tell people that this fascinating machine was built here? Well, I think they part of it is they have to understand the the Cold War, and perhaps we've reached a stage where so many people nowadays don't even realize there had been a Cold War and that we were on nuclear alert and between the Soviet Union and the United States we didn't know what was going to happen next and we'd have practice alerts to be able to show that we can respond uh, within from the time an enemy missile, a nuclear missile is detected coming across the polar regions that we had to have the last aircraft on alert off the ground before it would have hit. And uh, I, I don't think it's still classified, but we only had about anywhere, depending on where your base was, about 12 to 15 minutes reaction time to get the last bomber off the uh, ground before the missiles could hit. 
That, that was quite a, a rodeo, I bet, trying to get all the, those airplanes up in the air. That fast. Well, yes, and plus the fact that we had practice alerts. And you, when the horn went off, you didn't know if it was uh, World War III or whether it was just another practice. Most of the time it was a practice. Uh, in the beginning, we had an alpha alert uh, where we, we got to the aircraft and we got on the radio to find out what kind of alert it was. And if it was an alpha alert, we would note the time we were ready to start engines and report that when the, we were queued. But uh, if it was a Bravo alert, we'd start engines and get ready to taxi, but not taxi, and note the time we were ready to taxi. And if it was a Coco alert, we would taxi out to the active runway, apply the power, and then chop it back and note the time we were ready for takeoff. And uh, what happened was, especially the Cocos, because we were had to be in shelters because the B-58 uh, cockpit have clamshells and the rain could get in here, so we couldn't just sit on the ramp like a B-47 or a B-52. We had to be in a shelter that was covering them from the top. And because of that, we had to pull the aircraft in when we finished the alert and be, have a, a uke hooked to our nose and push us back into the shed. And that took time. And the first guy that got back from an alert might be back in the coffee shop in 20 minutes. And the last guy might be back in two hours. So uh, we had uh, quite a, a uh, competition to be first. They had a Christmas tree type affair and we'd be taxiing down the center and somebody be in their shelter and waiting for a space and they only needed a very small space and I've seen uh, airplanes come out of the hangar and afterburner just to get a whoop, stop and then chop back and get in there and so you had to be careful because it was quite an incentive to get back early to get some coffee. <laughs> That's great. Um, on uh, on alert, what did you do? Did you oh, have stuff gee, to do? Yeah, well, you watch TV. We, I became quite a good ping pong player. And uh, we had, uh, we did our flight planning for missions that we were gonna fly when we got off alert. So that we didn't have to come in for a day when we're norm not on alert. We might as well do our mission planning then. So we'd be on alert for a week and we'd also do some uh, recurrent training for weapons and for, uh, for the, the job that we would have to do if the horn went off. What, uh, what time periods did you spend on alert? We had to uh, go alert, I think it was Thursday morning. We had to show up about eight o'clock. We had our morning briefing and then we went out to the airplane and the old crew went with us and the old crew uh, began to get their material off the airplane, their, their gear, and we were bringing our gear on, and the, the responsibility for the, that alert sortie came when we took the lock off the box that tells us where we're going to go and put the new seal and lock back on. Now the new crew had the sortie. If the horn went off then, the new crew would uh, be the one to respond, and if it happened before then, the old crew would respond. Very interesting. Any other stories you want to tell us about the airplane? Oh, let's see. I remember the one of the first uh, times I, I went supersonic uh, and Mach 2 simulated bomb run in the B-58. Uh, we were coming in from the northwest to St. Louis Nike site and on those you pick a target and report it on the radio what your target is and the, the ground radar tracks your position and uh, you tell them which target you're going against and when you reach the bomb release point uh, the, you don't actually release a bomb but a tone breaks on that radio frequency and the computer picks up its stylus and figures out where the bomb would have hit had we really released one well, we're up there at 50,000 feet coming in at Mach 2. We had a 100 knot tailwind, so we're doing over 1,300 miles an hour ground speed. And just leveled off and 50,000 feet and everything looking good, so I engaged the autopilot. Yeah, okay, that looks pretty good. And I engaged the auto throttles. And just relaxing a little bit. Everything's looking good. And whoop, 60 degrees of bank. To the right. What's going on here? 
whoom, 60 degrees of bank to the left. Holy smokes, and I kicked off the autopilot, and I'm flying it manually now on the stick, and I says, what the heck happened, Herc, my navigator? He says, well, the crosshairs moved off the target to the right, so I moved him back to the left. I says, well, you sack of something, you should let me know when you're doing that, because, so here I am at 60 degrees of bank trying to center up the bomb aiming device. 20 seconds to go, we turn on the tone on radio frequency, and I'm still centering the, the aiming point. And just as the tone breaks, I'm rolling wings level on with a level. And I thought, okay, score that one, bomb plot. And you got it. What happens, even though it's just a simulated bomb run, you have to be scored so close to the target that uh, it would be an effective release. If not, you have to go to what we call the bloodbath the next day. That was a bad bomb board. And determine whether it was crew error or equipment, what was the problem. So we're a little concerned, and I bring the throttles out of afterburner, and we're descending down to subsonic altitude, about 30,000 feet, hanging forward in the harness, because even though we're still at 100%, with the afterburners off, we're decelerating so fast that you've, you're thrown forward in the harness. We get down to 30,000 feet, and we're given our post-release information, our true airspeed, and the wind, and heading, and stuff, so they can score it. And we're waiting and waiting and waiting for the score, hoping we don't have to go to the bloodbath the next day. And the score finally comes back as a Type 2C abort. I said, what's that? I have no idea. So the navigator gets out his book and thumbs through it to find out what the heck is it, uh, you know. And he finds that what it is says that the aircraft maneuvers exceeded the capability of the computer to figure out where it would have dropped, where it would have hit. And the small print says that if the crosshairs were on the aiming point, you get credit for a good release. So, hooray, we knew we were okay. That's a great story. What, uh, what was the plan? Let's say you, you did actually have to go fly to Russia. What do you do after you drop your bombs? Well, assuming everything is working okay, now you don't have the... Uh, pod anymore because the lower pod you jettisoned that after the last refueling when the tank went empty and then you took the nuclear upper pod into the target area and you released that on the target and you have uh, four smaller nuclear weapons under the wings uh, just outboard the fuselage and once you've dropped all those you go to your post strike base which depends on what your target was what your post strike base will be you have enough fuel to get there now you always had a problem because without a pod, you see the pod hangs forward and without the pod the airplane wants to sit on its tail if you fill up all the internal tanks. And so you can't fill up the aft tank all the way. And so to stay within limits, now you don't have much fuel. So in many of the cases, if we were going against southern European targets or Asian targets, we'd probably be coming back through uh, Africa the North African bases getting fuel and then we get some fuel, enough fuel at the western uh, airport before we cross the Atlantic and we'd cross the Atlantic to go to South America because that's the shortest distance and then we were to go uh, base by pace as much uh, fuel as we had to get back to uh, Little Rock or wherever we're going back to and then if uh, World War III is not over uh, we have a possibility we might get recycled back in for uh, further strikes, but no one ever knew that. You were based at Little Rock? Yes. Uh -huh. How was Little Rock uh, during those times as a place to live? Well, I just spent five years in Minot, North Dakota. So it was a garden paradise. Oh yes, it was quite nice. And after comparing a, a Minot to Little Rock, we were in heaven. The kids, the wife, everything. We, we thought Little Rock was just great. Very good. Well, appreciate you talking to us. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. You bet. Oh.